So I think there was a tipping point with the Sri Lanka Singapore FTA. It included goods, services, investment, government procurement, e-commerce, uh, all of that. Preferential treatments are very important. You also mentioned it, the US. Two thirds of Sri Lankan exports are going to the US or the EU, both giving preferential treatments. When we specifically look at the EU GSP, we have 66% of our tariff lines uh, given preferential access or zero duty to the EU. <laughs> Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of our interview series Shared Values partnering with Reshaped Europe. The Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom Sri Lanka office in partnership with Economic Next uh, is looking at how uh, you know Europe and Sri Lanka have so many shared values that we you know focus on and and how can we build on those shared values to create a more prosperous country. And today, um, everyone is really talking about how do we, you know, increase our exports and bring in more foreign exchange into the country. And I think it's a very apt time uh, and, and with a wonderful panel to discuss how trade agreements and trade preferences can be a competitive tool uh, to increase exports. Um, I'm joined with me uh, by quite a few friends, um, starting off with uh, Anushka Vijay Singha. Anushka is an economist and uh, co-founder of the Center for a Smart Future. Uh, he consults on, on, um, on trade policy uh, regionally um, and we're glad to have him uh, with us. Uh, welcome, Anushka. Hi, Imran. Good to be here. Um, next, I have Jaini Ratnayaka. She is an economist with the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce, um, which is Sri Lanka's uh, leading trade chamber. Um, welcome, Jaini. Thank you very much. Um, and last but not least, our good friend, um, Andres hergen uh, Andres is the Joint Managing Director and Head of Market Entry um, and Sustainability at JAR Corporate Solutions. And before that, um, he has had a long career with AHK, uh, which is a, a delegation of German industry and commerce. Um, and AHK is present all around the world and I've, I've had dealt with them. A um, wonderful organization that promotes uh, two-way trade between countries. Welcome to all of you. I'm going to start off with you, uh, Anushka. Look, um, <laughs> uh, we are very ambivalent about things like trade agreements and you know, trade preferences regimes. Um, and so I'm going to ask you straight off, how important are these tools you know, uh, in terms of for a country like Sri Lanka to increase our exports? Uh, so Imran, the, these can be quite important, um, but I think we first have to separate out trade agreements mm. with trade preferences. So I think trade preferences are unilateral, mm. given to us by another country, and these are incredibly important because that country or region is giving you uh, something extra special. Uh, for example, EU GSP Plus or US GSP. Trade agreements are bilateral, which they, there is some give and take. Uh, and I think there. The first reason why they are useful is that they signal an intent to cooperate, they signal an intent to uh, globalize, they signal an intent to open up to trade. Um, and I think that's the, that's the number one. And that signaling uh, point is, is quite significant. Um, the second perhaps obvious aspect of how useful it is, is that it gets you market access. So while at the same time we as Sri Lanka are giving market access, we gain market access, preferential market access to that other country if it's a bilateral uh, or regional trade agreement. Uh, and, at, and most often that helps to, uh, and the margin of preference that we get sometimes helps to uh, negate or compensate some of the domestic um, costs or competitiveness issues and still make us competitive in that market vis-a-vis -vis some of our competitors. Um, I think another uh, aspect of why these agreements are useful is that it spurs on uh, doing some domestic policy reforms that may otherwise have got delayed. Yes. And I think for, for me a great example of that was with the Sri Lanka Singapore FDA. Uh, one of the important uh, things that we wanted to get done in order to sign that, coming also from pressure, was finally legislating the Anti-Dumping and Countervailing Measures Act. And these had, this had been bobbing along in and out of parliament or government offices for almost 10 years. But catalyzing getting that legislated was the Sri Lanka-Singapore Free Trade Agreement. Right. And this is just one of many examples, even in other countries we see uh, region, like some of the mega regional trade agreements like uh, RCEP and CPTPP, 
One of the reasons countries want to get into this it, is because it gives the government at the time and other stakeholders uh, a reason to do some of those domestic reforms that may otherwise have got pushed. And fi finally, I think what I would say is that it gives a signal to investors. Mm. Even if you have a goods agreement, and we saw this with the Sri Lanka-India one. And also Pakistan. Pakistan. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Uh, even with a goods agreement, it does signal to investors that the country is interested in cooperating. And there's a trade investment nexus that kicks in, and you have investors coming in, not only from that country, but from others, to locate here and export. And a great example came from a recent uh, study I did for uh, uh, the trade promotion agency of a developed country that wanted us to analyze Sri Lanka's trade agreements and see how that makes it favorable for investors of that country to locate here. Nice. And these are all goods trade agreements, but still investors were, were being promoted to come here and locate. So I would say these are, these are some of the reasons why it's useful, but I hope at some point we can talk about the fact that it's not the end all and be all. And we have to kind of be mindful of the limitations of what these trade agreements and trade preferences can, can offer. Mm. Um, Jaini, uh, I think the, uh, Anushka has laid out the, you know, uh, um, the map in terms of how beneficial these, these instruments are and agreements are. Um, the next most, I think, more important question is how effective have these agreements been you know, to increase our trade? Uh, preferably our export, but also overall trade. Yes. Um, so, um, when we look at uh, Sri Lanka's uh, trade um, journey, especially starting off from, let's say, 2000 onwards, we see Sri Lanka entering into a um, few bilateral trade agreements starting from 2000 with India, which is our first uh, bilateral FTA. Then in 2005, we enter into PSFTA with Pakistan. So like that, our journey has continued somewhat slowly mm -hmm. compared to uh, our peer, um, other competitor countries. But what's important is that we need to uh, look at the trade agreements um, in the light, you know, how much of um, trade it has been able to create for the country and how much of even trade diversion it has been able Absolutely. to create so that therefore we are able to even source certain products from other countries uh, because now the trade agreement gives you a new avenue to get it cheaper. So you have to look at these trade agreements uh, from few perspectives I would say. And um, another important measure to look at is uh, whether a country has been successful in getting into trade agreements with its strategic partners. Mm. So uh, when we look at Sri Lanka's, let's um, look at the export side of it first. We know about um, close to 25% of our exports go to EU region, mm. about 30% to US, 10% um, close to about 7.5% to 10% to UK, another 7% to India. So uh, of, uh, when you look at these uh, countries, we have about 70% of our exports covered. So in that terms, yes, Sri Lanka does have either a preferential or FTA a relationship with some of the key strategic partners when it comes to Sri Lanka's exports as well. So in those slides, we can broadly say that Sri Lanka has been somewhat successful in getting into trade relations with our strategic partners, but how deep these trade agreements are and how a fight can really go really depends on how best these uh, trade agreements have been um, um, built especially when you look at the architect of it. Um, let's just look at the Sri Lanka-India um, FTA. Um, it's, it's our first FTA, like I mentioned before, and they have a I lot of... It also negotiated in a hurry, if I'm not mistaken, exactly. in 2000. Exactly, yes. and there were a lot of criticism at mm. the time we um, entered into this FTA, but it has changed the landscape of Sri Lanka in a way that no one has really, you know, able to foresee. Um, what's really interesting is although this agreement was only focused on goods, you also see many um, investment flows also coming from India to Sri Lanka uh, after the FTA was signed. And that FTA was also um, negotiated two decades back. So those days, uh, the, the kind of um, supplementary um, or complementary packages that comes to FTA were not really available. Like you don't really get into deep negotiations on how we iron out some of the non-tariff mm. barriers mm. to FTA. So for it, example, in Indian ports. Yes, for example, problem. Indian ports. And although we have got preferential access to India, we've seen that due to many other non-tariff issues, 
issues that we have not really been able to get the market access. So then we see how we really iron out those issues by maybe entering into more comprehensive kind of FTAs. So it really sort of uh, opens up a new pathway for us to look at things in a different light. So in that terms, I think FTA is very important. Even a preferential agreement is. Uh, when you look at the preferential uh, agreements we have, like with the EU, with the US, there are many other countries that we have GSP schemes as well. But um, and those are mostly unilateral kind of agreements. But still, it really gives us uh, the opportunity in, to enter into these markets. Uh, at a competitive tariff and therefore establish our presence there and at a time and a day that when we are no, not able to utilize these, that our uh, exporters are really having a strong footing in this market. So in terms of creating those strategic relationships, getting those uh, establishments in place, I think it's very important. Just to bring you one stat, I think, uh, when we look at Sri Lanka's export stats for 2021 and 2020, uh, 2021 specifically, uh, it was about uh, close to about uh, 10 million uh, USD million value. But out of that, about 44% of our exports have been through the preferential routes. I either through a GSP, either through a FTA. So it really showcases why these trade agreements are important for a country. Excellent. Excellent. That's, that's good to hear. Um, Jani mentioned uh, the, the US being one of, one of our most important trading partners. I think one of our oldest trading partners as well, uh, Andres. Um, do you have any examples of other countries that have utilized these trade preferences to you know, increase exports that we can use as, as you know, inspiration? Yeah, <clears throat> when we're talking about trade preferences from the EU side, you know there are different models. GSP Plus is one model for lower middle income country. You know, then you have the standard GSP also for the um, higher middle income countries and you have the EBAs, the everything but, but arms for the least developed countries. But if you see the utilization uh, rate of uh, those countries, how they are dealing with these preferential systems, then you see significant differences. No? If we see, for example, the case of Sri Lanka, we see also there is an underutilization of the GSP Plus facility. Maybe that is due to a lack of communication, also a strategic dialogue. If we compare that, for example, to Pakistan, Pakistan has a utilization rate of 97%, while Sri Lanka is about 62%. And that's, of course, the question, why is that so? <laughs> exactly. no? um, then um, we see also countries that are under the EBA, countries like uh, Bangladesh, uh, that have really succeeded to drive their exports with double digit export rates. And also there's a very high dependency on the GSP uh, EBA, and I think that shows also how important these unilateral trade preferential agreements are. But I think um, Anushka mentioned the, the FTAs, the big difference, it's not bilateral, and also it is limited in time. And we all know that uh, EBA is related to 15 human rights conventions, GSP plus to 27 human rights conventions. There's a continuous monitoring process. Of course, the process to lose really the preferential uh, treatment is a long process. No, it doesn't come overnight, but the danger is there. And we have seen the case of Cambodia and the impact also for Cambodia, where we had a yearly loss of about 800 million US dollars, and we had an increase of prices on the European market between 11 and 15, 17 percent. So drawing back uh, the preferential treatment has a direct effect on exporters. And then if you see the case for Sri Lanka, no, product exporters are the major contributors of uh, foreign uh, exchange here in the country, very much needed no, in a time where we have really a historic uh, shortage of foreign currency. So therefore, I think um, it could be really very interesting to look furthermore into that topic and also to see, okay, preferential treatments are very important. You also mentioned it, the US. Two thirds of Sri Lankan exports are going to the US or the EU, both giving preferential treatments. We have Australia then again, but if you see everything, I think most of uh, the, the exports, I would say maybe 75% are going to countries that offering preferential uh, agreements or uh, free trade uh, agreements. Um, and then the question is, so what to do for the future, no? how to develop the strategy? If I remember here the past four years, how FDAs have been discussed here, how negatively they have discussed here. No? It's also the Singapore one, which for me was a symbolic 
political act to do that, maybe a certain commitment to free and open trade. But if we compare Sri Lanka then to its, its competitors, to other countries that have really implemented strategic policies like Vietnam. No, you mentioned it also, Anushka, it is not only trade related. If you have a comprehensive free trade agreement, you have the investment related methods also integrated as investment protection also. And we have seen the consequences in Vietnam. If you see the incoming FDIs during the last years, the highest growth rate from the European side is in Vietnam. Yeah, that, that's something clear. It's a communist country, but free trade agreement, not only with the European Union, but with Japan. Uh, with the ASEAN countries, with Australia, with so many other markets. And then we see how important market access is, not only for increasing exports, but also for attracting foreign direct investments. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, Mr. please. I, yeah, I, I think Andres's point and example of uh, countries like Vietnam is very important because in a way, even while we talk about trade agreements and trade preferences, we often typically, particularly with trade agreements, we, we what's top of mind is bilateral agreements. Mm. And I think we really have to move away from this obsession with bilateral trade agreements for so many reasons. One is that you, Sri Lanka is out of practice mm. with FDA negotiations. Mm. Yes. So then do you like want... The, like the UK, uh, when they were going to breakfast, breakfast, they didn't even have enough trade negotiators. They actually <laughs> had to bring in new capacity. So Sri Lanka is out of practice. So then when you're out of practice, do you try and do individual bilateral FTAs with multiple countries, you know, sucking up uh, all of the oxygen in the room? Are you going to use that limited oxygen to get better bang for buck and go for being part of some of the mega regional trade agreements that are rapidly shaping our region? Um, and I think uh, as uh, Professor Premachand Rautukurala at ANU often likes to say, Sri Lanka has to uh, has to get over this obsession with Mickey Mouse FTAs. Mm. Mm. What he means is that these are fairly simple, um, not really comprehensive, not deep. So I think there was a tipping point with the Sri Lanka Singapore FTA. Mm. It included goods, services, mm. investment, government procurement, e-commerce, uh, all of that. So now that we have made this step, I think focusing the next round not on quote unquote Mickey Mouse bilateral FTAs, but really spending that limited bandwidth we have to get the best outcome with mega regionals, uh, deeper, you get more countries in one go. Uh, it's not going to be easy because we have to concede more, we have to do more of the domestic reforms. But look around us, you know, all these countries had the same issues, Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, many ASEAN countries, but they recognize that bilateral FTAs have done its bit. Mm. And if we are going to move forward, we can't afford to waste time with doing a slew of tiny, 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 tiny bilateral FTAs. Mm. Excellent insight. I think even UK had decided to join some of the FTAs that I not in sorry, multi, um, you know, uh, multilateral agreements in, in, in Asia where they are not even, you know, um, regionally, you know, geographically member because they value, they see value then, you know, negotiating which ones. So there's an elephant in the room and that that is, uh, you know, uh, the possible loss of GSP plus, right? Um, the European Parliament passed a resolution, I think, about a year back, uh, you know, starting the process to some extent. Uh, I think uh, you were involved uh, to some extent in, you know, getting it back in 2017 with a lot of effort when we had lost it. Um, and I think IPS has done a study that shows that, you know, we could lose up to 627 million US dollars in the event that that this GSP, um, uh, you know, plus is, is withdrawn. How do we keep it? I mean, you know how the official process goes. No? There's a monitoring process uh, yearly done uh, by the European Union uh, when it comes to the compliance with the 27 human rights um, conventions and there has been a dialogue. Um, I think during the last dialogue the um, Prevention uh, Terrorism Act was one of the major topics. I think then the Sri Lankan government drafted uh, of that. Yeah, exactly. And there's a, there's a discussion still ongoing. Um, but um, yeah, it shows how important it is no, to, to comply to these, to these conventions. Because we signed up. Yeah. You know, we signed up to uh, comply as opposed to, you know, it being uh, this thing. We signed up saying we would make a commitment. So Yes. And just to add to that, like when we specifically look at the EU GSP, we have 66% of our tariff lines uh, given preferential access or zero duty to the EU. 
through the GSP. So it shows how important it is. But I think there is another important aspect we need to look at. Um, that is, um, you mentioned about the 27 conventions. But these conventions uh, we've signed because we want to enter Absolutely. into the GSP. But then if, whether the GSP is going to be there or not, we have to honor those 27 conventions going forward. So therefore, we and, need... And, and I think we, we signed up also because we believed in some of these conventions, exactly. almost all of them, right? And because it really <laughs> gives has given us an opportunity to really uh, look at um, some of the more broader um, uh, things um, in a different light. So as a country, I think we all as citizens, not just the government, but also as citizens, as businesses, need to understand that honoring these 27 conventions are important because we have taken a commitment for it. So therefore, there has to be better communication also amongst all stakeholders involved as to why it matters. And honoring these 27 commitments, I think, really uh, gives us an opportunity and puts us in even a better footing when we enter into even future FTAs or future trade agreements with other counterparts because it shows that as a country we are in a different level and that we are honoring these conventions so therefore we are genuine about what we need to do. Absolutely. So therefore there needs to be better communication and a strong voice that goes out from Sri Lanka, not like different people talking different things. So therefore, it's a distorted message that goes out from here. So I think we have to definitely stop doing that. Mm -hmm. That's very important. So, so in Imran, you asked what, how do we keep it? Uh, and it depends on what this it is. If we narrowly take it to mean we want to keep GSP plus for as long as possible, then I think uh, the answer there is, as Andrea said, recognizing that we have signed up to certain things. These weren't shoved down our throat. We wanted to do it. And in fact, uh, I was very surprised in the earlier instance when we lost GSP+. Plus, I, I recall vividly a, a conversation with a JVP uh, lawmaker who, who said, you know, wh why is this uh, so confusing? You can't go onto a cricket pitch to play a game with another party, with another team, but you're storming out in the pitch saying, oh, by the way, I'm happy to play, but with my rules. I don't want the common rules. I don't want to play by your rules. And it was remarkable when he said that, because it's exactly what it is, right? You're, you're trying to go in with something that both sides have agreed on and then say, mm, we want to play differently. Uh, so the other aspect is if the it is not just retaining GSP+, plus, but retaining the relationship we have with Europe, retaining the relationship we have with European buyers, then I think we would also approach it differently. Because how we graduate from GSP Plus, is it in a systematic orderly way with the necessary timeline? Or do we lose it abruptly because we have done bad things? As we had done before. Exactly. Will determine that relationship beyond GSP Plus with Europe. And I think understanding that, making sure that our firms understand that, our government understands that, so that even after GSP+, plus, listen, it's, it's going away at some point. Obvious. But after that, do we still have that relationship? Are our firms seen as good partners who understand European rules, European preferences, new national and European level uh, regulations around environment and so on coming in? I think that's what we really need to focus on. So short term, retaining GSP plus by doing things we signed up to and not trying to, you know, go cowboy on it. Um, but really looking beyond that on making sure we retain that good relationship eventually when GSP plus is... Uh, is and I think smooth. the example that we can also take is how our relationship with Japan has deteriorated. We have ab abruptly pulled out for projects we have, you know, uh, signed up to do with them. And, and that's a very long relationship. Um, and there's, there's a new threat, I wouldn't say threat, also an opportunity really uh, emerging where, you know, um, uh, the EU and also I think um, US 
uh, you know implementing some of the older laws around sustainable supply chains we've seen uh, particularly you, you've seen action from from the US which has surprises me on on Malaysian glove exporters i think the EU also will uh, take action on that in the middle of covid right so they really needed it but because it was you know um, and, and, and modern slavery actions and then also uh, you know around uh, violating uh, human rights so how do we you know how do we start uh, preparing for for that new law in the EU um, and german legislation as well um how do our companies prepare because i i don't think we are uh, even aware of them let alone you know <laughs> knowing how to prepare i think there are some companies they are very well aware of that no because sustainability is not a new topic mm-hmm. the the united nations guiding principles on business and human rights exist for may have been existed for many years and there have been national policies implemented not with enforceable frames like the modern slavery act in the uk or the loi de la vigilance in france uh, the fair trade facilitation act in the us where we always had a legal frame to comply with sustainability requirements but furthermore there are norms that have been developed consumer driven by the industries themselves norms like social accountability 8000 sedex meta business social compliance initiative and if we take consumer goods now especially for sri lanka apparel and uh, rubber related products they are very well aware of that because even today the the, the law is not has not come into force until now no it will be applied from the 1st of january 2023 the the act on corporate um, due diligence and supply chains in germany for example um, but already now sri lankan exporters comply with these industry driven standards and uh, they are they know without complying to these standards they are not able to export so uh, the larger retailers wholesalers importers in europe they have already set this up as an as a requirement so it's not a completely new topic but we think that it could be developed into a unique selling point in the moment when it will be obligatory for everybody <clears throat> not only for the big importers or retailers or wholesalers but when it will become a law and every company has to upload its documents under a specific reporting frame to justify that they are sup- uh, supplying sustainably yeah and the sustainability in supply chains does not only mean that you analyze your company about working condition that you don't have uh, forced uh, labor or a uh, child labor um, <clears throat> that you don't use uh, hazardous chemicals and so on but it means also that you have to s- go down the supply chain until the last tier yeah this means for the apparel industry for example if it is cotton and then the us comes in you know the chin yang act on uh, on uh, on cotton that you cannot uh, import any cotton anymore from uh, this province in in china it has a really a very deep impact so you have to analyze how you manage these um, sustainability gaps and risks that that is so that's a very long process no so first of all the companies have to do a risk analysis a gap assessment then then they have to adapt the internal processes they have to set up a management system which will then avoid all this risk in a standardized way and then they have to adapt all the procedures again and set that up in a continuous reporting frame which will be continuously controlled yeah and uh, this needs a mindset we have large companies like MAS or Hydramani or parts of Haley's um uh, John Condiments uh, Aitken Spence plantations they have already done these uh, implemented some of these procedures the new law in Germany now really goes a step further no because it's really an enforceable frame and it is also related to very high fines so if the target group is the German importer who will of course transfer that obligation to his supplier so the german importer has to upload all these documents from his suppliers to justify that they are complying with the sustainable uh, standards uh, in germany which are based of course on the un united uh, nations uh, guiding principle of business and human rights and you know all the other uh, related conventions that we have there so i think it's quite challenging but i see that there is really an opportunity you know because sri lanka has been very advanced in the apparel industry already 2006 we had garment without gills you no know, that was certified by sgs that was a good move 
not including all aspects of sustainability, but it was a good move in the right direction. Then even in the tourism industry, we had travel light, two third uh, certifications here from Sri Lankan companies. We have a lot of companies that are fair trade certified, SA8000 certified, BSCI, but we have to put that into a marketing strategy no to 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 see that is my suggestion that the made in sri lanka would be somehow related to sustainability but with a real with a real label and then um, it could not be only a burden because in the beginning it is a burden it is cost intensive and also manpower intensive mm -hmm. okay so anyway, i want to come to you so in addition to what you know andres has described and and, and that uh, you know comprises all the large companies and they are aware of something that is going on um, when you look at your wider membership, what are the challenges that they have in, in terms of, you know, uh, fully exploiting uh, both trade agreements and trade preferences? Yes. Um, so I would like to uh, quote an example, um, which Andrew mentioned. Um, he said the utilization rate for Pakistan for GSP is over 90 percent, but for Sri Lanka, it's somewhat closer to 50 percent. So that also, to some extent, uh, yeah. um, explains uh, the issues that we are also having in Sri Lanka uh, in, in uh, trying to, um, you know, get our exports uh, channeled through the preferential schemes. Um, so when we have um, um, been discussing these issues with our membership, so um, it's often Often we uh, co come across this issue uh, related to non-tariff barriers. Mm. Um, so one of the uh, biggest issues that have been highlighted by the businesses that have been um, trading either with the EU or even with a more regional country like uh, India, um, uh, we've been having lots of issues related to certification. Um, so that's also largely because uh, most of the preferential agreements we have almost all of the preferential agreements we have uh, doesn't have this complete package where you have a mutual recognition agreement yes. uh, where the certification that's done in Sri Lanka is recognized by our counterpart. So as a result, uh, some of the products that are certified here when it goes to uh, the um, export market, it's then again retested and therefore there's a huge cost that these businesses have to incur and therefore as a result of these, uh, there's um, this discouragement for exports uh, to go from Sri Lanka to these countries. So that's just one part of the issue. So how we resolve this, this has been in the discussion for over a decade now. Um, and um, there have been many discussions with the strategic partners to see how we really at least start entering into some sort of a mutual recognition for some of the prioritized products that we have market entry through these preferential agreements. And um, I would say it, uh, the ETCA agreement that we were negotiating uh, with India is a fine example on that because while the negotiations on a comprehensive agreement took place, you know, trying to expand it beyond goods to bring in services, investment elements, a key part of the negotiation was also focused on how we resolve the outstanding issues of the bilateral FTA. And uh, MRA was at the heart of it. So therefore, at that time, there were even Indian uh, laboratories that visited Sri Lanka, did uh, certain uh, audits to see how we can really, you know, uh, carve out MRA space to uh, facilitate market entry for some of the products. And that stands um, true, not just for India, but for even the EU, because um, recently we did um, a consultancy uh, for um, a UK-based um, uh, institute uh, when the UK was really uh, getting into this new uh, GSP arrangement. And in that, one of the key issues that was highlighted by our businesses during the consultations was the certification issue. And apart from that, I'd like to also highlight another key issue that's uh, really embedded in the agreement itself, which is the rules of origin criteria. Um, so all the country gets a preferential access through FTA doesn't mean that they can instantly export the product, that you need to comply with so many other requirements and rules of origin is one of the key things to look at. And so when we look at specifically the EU uh, GSP, especially the apparel sector has had lots of issues related to the rules of origin because there's a double transformation requirement for apparel. So therefore, the GSP really um, promotes uh, accumulation of uh, uh, material from either the developed developing countries. So for example, that means the SAFTA region for Sri Lanka 
or from countries where the EU have bilateral trade agreements with. Okay. So therefore, when we look at Sri Lanka's uh, profile, most of the import in, in, input comes from China. China so yes. therefore, it's really difficult for our exporters to comply with the double, transfer, double transformation rule. And there have been ongoing negotiations even with the EU to see how we really enter into certain bilateral accumulations to negate some of the issues. But unfortunately, some of those discussions have not gone forth. Um, and we have not really seen um, like you know positive results coming out of it. But that has been a key issue that have been highlighted by our exporters, the rules of origin. Interesting. Yeah, with regard to certification, I think that's a very important topic, but I think it's not so much about mutual recognition, no, because we have to be honest, in Sri Lanka we don't have any laboratories. No, even to do an organic certification, you have to send up your goods to Rotterdam, to Control Union or to any way else in the world to get the certification done. And then, of course, the Sri Lankan standards, what we have, for example, the good manufacturing practice, the GMP, does not correspond at all to the international standards. So I think mutual recognition could only be started if there would be really a strategic approach of the government to set up here an infrastructure for laboratories and for certification bodies. Until now, I haven't seen that that has been encouraged at all. We got a request from certification bodies to come to Sri Lanka and to invest there. The certification bodies that we have currently here, like SGS or like Control Union, they are here with their consultancy team, but they don't have their own infrastructure. So every time there is a testing or a certification that has to go out. I think that's very important mm, because we cannot absolutely. claim that to the EU. That should be, I think, a part of the national policy. If we want to drive exports, then at least um, the testing facilities should be here. And also maybe a closer cooperation with uh, institutes of metrology setting up norms to really make sure that in the future when these infrastructure would be here in the country, mutual recognition could be a real topic. Yeah. And with, for, with regards to the rules of origin also, I think it's a very complex topic, no? but, but you know that um, these rules are also yeah, political, human rights related driven. Now, what we see with China now, that's an absolute no-go now for the European Union and for the US. But I have talked to many apparel producers. They have managed to source now up to 90% from India or South Asian countries. Of course, there are price differences. and uh, But uh, that's something I think also which is very difficult um, to negotiate, no? because um, these are value-based um, decisions that have been taken there on the on the European side. Uh, I know that it is an issue for the exporters, but I think it's um, very difficult. Yes, yeah. but another also you need to. Uh, I think the example comes from India because India itself uh, was trying to get this mutual recognition, particularly for their labs. And I think initially the, the trading partners really didn't want to do that. But then there is a now quite a robust uh, ecosystem within India to set up these uh, certifications of, or even domestically owned by Indian you know, companies that are acceptable. I to also want to um, uh, just highlight, like with these uh, trading agreements or relationships we have, we also um, create an ecosystem where these countries do you know, um, provide greater facilitation for trade. And one good example uh, with the EU is that we have seen a lot of technical assistance coming into Sri Lanka mm -hmm. because we do have that you know great relationship through the GSP so not just from 2015 onwards that we've had uh, a, a great uh, technical assistant assistance program uh, from the EU where uh, with the help of UNIDO a comprehensive um, uh, strategy was done on how we improve the quality infrastructure of Sri Lanka and certification, all those issues you mentioned were really covered through that strategy. So uh, when we have these kind of, I think, important relationships, it does really you know, provide us with many other technical assistance. And I think Sri Lanka has to be more strategic as to how we utilize those opportunities because there have been lots of feasibilities being done, lots of scoping studies being done. and 
robust plan of actions being um, finalized with many stakeholder consultations, but for unfortunate reasons that we have seen that it has not really, you know, gone its uh, full journey towards implementation. So therefore, there has been a lot of uh, progress, but I think uh, if we can um, really get our acts together and focus on some of those key elements, especially in terms of certification, what we need to do, I think it won't be difficult for us to enter into this path, even like, you know, in a, in a slow manner. Mm. Anushka, I want to come to you, um, because one of the things I've noticed for a long time is that our export mix has not changed much. And to take advantage fully, particularly the US GSP, which I think we have very underutilized, right? Um, um, we really need to look at this mix of what we are, you know, exporting, to, uh, and not just targeted towards, you know, trade agreements or differences, but, the, you know, to look at where the consumer wants and where the consumer is going, right? How do we do this? Because our exporters have a particular mindset, and it's very difficult to move them. So you're right, Imran, in that. Um Export diversification in terms of the headline sectors, and if you loosely, you know, the, at perhaps the HS heading level, we haven't seen the kind of dramatic transformation in our export mix as, say, Vietnam and Thailand. But I do want to, you know, s um, kind of set some um, optimism here Excellent. that at a firm level and at maybe at a more product level, sub-sector level, we have seen firms doing new things. Excellent. And new sectors have gradually emerged, which I think is, is a good good sign. Uh, within apparels, we've seen them diversifying into, you know, wearable technology and, you know, at, at leisure and all kinds of new new sectors that uh, crisscross multiple sectors. You're no longer now in the apparel space, but you're in the apparel and wellness space or you're in the apparel and electronic space. Uh, and that is within an industry diversification. Within spices, for example, so many new Sri Lankan firms doing flavor extracts um, and f uh, you know flavors and extracts, essences that's going into pharmaceuticals, nutraceuticals, into perfumes, into pro processed food and beverage. And these are just within existing sectors that we say haven't diversified, but also new sectors. For example, two that were highlighted in the national export strategy. Uh, boat building and electronic components. Mm -hmm. And if you just take electronic components, I think um, most Sri Lankans don't know that we have uh, uh, manufacturing happening in Sri Lanka for European markets, for instance, and Australian markets, uh, precision weighing uh, electronic components, including uh, uh, components that go into baby incubators, right? We have um, uh, automotive wire harnesses, impact sensors, printed circuit boards. So this is an example of a sector that certainly has emerged. But you're right, to the dramatic extent that we've seen in other countries, it, it hasn't. Uh, and I think some of the reasons for that lack of diversification um, are many. Uh, one would argue that we don't have enough innovation and entrepreneurship uh, um, taking place to, to diversify. But uh, in the interest of time, I just want to focus on one aspect of that export diversification issue. And I think it's investment, both domestic and foreign. On the domestic side, our best companies are deploying their capital inefficiently. Some of our best companies who have the capital, who in many other parts of the world would have diversified into export-oriented businesses, into electronics and so on, using the capital heft that they have. Mm. They're comfortable in domestic non-tradable sectors, Absolutely. like real estate, real estate <laughs> like um, trading. Yes. Um, some of them are focused on sectors that are very comfortable because of import protection. So on the domestic investment side, we have investments that stuck in these, frankly, less exciting sectors and uh, a nudge is required uh, it, that nudge has to come in different ways to, to, to start ex, uh, uh, diversifying. Um, the other is foreign and I think the role that uh, investment and FDI plays in diversifying your export basket is huge. Uh, we've seen that with countries like Vietnam, with Thailand, uh, so many other countries where the role of FDI coming in to take you into new markets, to take you into new products, to partner with local firms to uh, create new new things is huge. And I would argue that um, one of the biggest 
focuses, uh, if our objective is, a, is export diversification, should be on creating the climate for investment and purposeful uh, targeting and focusing on uh, export-oriented sectors, export-oriented investment, not domestic non-tradables, uh, market-seeking um, mm. FDI. And we saw that if you do that, existing investors will help the country. I think uh, Andreas might even remember um, there were electronic manufacturers from, from Europe, including one in Switzerland, who said, if you want to bring in more electronic folks, we will join you on an investment promotion mission in our country to tell others like us, our peers, our supplier network, why they should come to Sri Lanka. And I think it has been That's the IT BPM sector as well. You know, partners overseas have been quite happy to host delegations from Sri Lanka, even though, even, you know, in terms of their competitors as well. Mm, but it's very low, no, to be honest. Yes. No, and yes. I think for me, the major problem is communication and the lack of a clear strategy. Absolutely. Yeah. Even if you are talking about the well-established sectors of apparel, I had two weeks back a discussion with Jaff about the lack of these communication strategy. And you are right, we have a variable technologies now. MIS is really technology-wise heading really on material search, on design, on electronic appliances in apparel. So, but there's no communication about it. It's MAS and MAS is going to ISPO and to other big shows in the world, but that's not a parallel made in Sri Lanka. So a parallel made in Sri Lanka could be innovated, could be sustainable, and we have to label that. And I think to have a continuous work on a communication strategy, it's so important. Otherwise, you will not identify these new markets. The same also for electronics. Uh, you, I agree with you, sensor technology, nobody knows about it, what is happening here in Sri Lanka, because it is not promoted. You no, know? And if it is promoted, you have a uh, booth, a participation, which looks like maybe in the beginning of the 90s with no persons <laughs> able to communicate. No, Absolutely. I'm telling you the truth. Absolutely. It's also the, the same, uh, also for the service sectors. You know, for IT and BPM, we have uh, organized a uh, delegation for ITC in the beginning of 2018, going to the world's largest uh, event for information technology, CBIT at that time in Hannover. But, you know, there is no real strategy. If you compare this IT and BPM sector, how it has been developed in India, in, uh, majorly in Bangalore, or in the Philippines, in Manila, you see where they are. Manila has created hubs now for, for BPM. And this, these are also opportunities for Sri Lanka, but they are, it's not existing. Also for the food items, now we have Ceylon the cinnamon, that was a long process, no, uh, supported by UNIDO and funded by the EU, and uh, finally it's there. We but have a GI that, for that, yes. Yeah, the, uh, geographic indication. So now there's something really that, that should happen in the communication. You have to be visible, you have to be present, and you have to anticipate these trends. And then to develop a made in Sri Lanka that is related to a content. I think that's very important. But when I talk here to major exporters, and I, wa I wanted always to group them in one place under the Sri Lankan flag to promote that as a quality product of Sri Lanka. Then you listen even to very well-established businessmen. No, I don't want to go with the Sri Lankan pavilion. I will go in Hall 7 because my product is better. So that uh, sense of really promoting something together is, uh, is not so much developed, but it is really very needed no? Absolutely. if you want to achieve Absolutely. something. And I think the good news is that there are firms that we can celebrate. Yeah. So the starting point is there. Now it's about creating that wrapping about the country positioning. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that for a country like Sri Lanka that is so desperate to get in new FDI, so desperate to create export-oriented sectors, so desperate to create more export earnings, the two apex institutions have been hugely underinvested in, um, BOI and the EDB, right? So a lot of the things that Andreas was talking about, there's a certain level that can be done by firms, individual firms, in sector associations, but then you have that taking it to the next step that has to have the backing of government institutions. And I think we, uh, if we are serious about this export diversification, export-oriented investment, we have to get serious also about arming the Export Development Board and the BOI with new skills, new ideas, and otherwise we're doing a huge disservice to our entrepreneurs. Yeah. I have uh, one quick uh, yeah. point to compliment what Anushka said and I think also we need to focus a lot on how we create um, facilitation around the border uh, because looking at how fragmented the production is like even if you're 
say, producing one component in Sri Lanka, that it cannot be held up here, that it has to move in and out of the border quickly. So there has to be a lot of facilitation at the border itself. And I think that also needs to be looked at if you are to design that comprehensive package to really diversify exports. Not to be done, um, but I think uh, we have a path in which uh, we can proceed. Um, on behalf of the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom uh, and Economy Next, uh, Anushka, um, Jani and uh, Andres, uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you.